Well, hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Uh, this is a roundtable conversation on schools and school reopenings. Uh, today's focus is shifting to that topic. Uh, yesterday, we had one on healthcare and human services, and uh, we have numerous others on, uh, on the website of conversations about a range of topics impacted by COVID-19 and the shifts in our society. Uh, so today, we're going to be talking about schools reopening. Uh, there are a lot that we all want to get figured out. Uh, we all being students, educators, parents, folks that want to get to work, folks that want to keep our kids safe, uh, and we all want it to get back to normal. Uh, but we all know that I think that's probably not going to be full normal for some time. So maybe we get a vaccine or a better cure and medical practice opportunities. But there are many challenges to opening our schools and resuming in-person learning in a safe and equitable way. We know that's a big issue around the state as well. So today I've brought together a number of people um, for a conversation on some of the current reopening plans and to discuss some of the many questions that have been raised around reopening schools in our state. So with me today are Senator Philip Ruth, the chair of the Senate Committee on Education, Noel Green, principal of Burlington High School, Chris Duros, a special education teacher at the Main Street Middle School in Montpelier, Jessica Harris, a special education teacher at Derby Elementary School, and Kate McCann, a math teacher at U32 High School in Montpelier and the 2017 Teacher of the Year. I wanna thank you all for joining me today. Thank you, David. And I also wanna just make sure to indicate at the beginning here as I regularly do, that participation in these roundtables does not constitute an endorsement but we do bring folks from all perspectives and, and experiences to try to have these conversations. So let's get right into it. Uh, this week, parents in 16 school districts, including my own, uh, covering Addison, Chittenden, and Franklin counties were informed of a hybrid instruction model that will include both in-person and remote learning. Uh, focus on the, if we could focus on the social, emotional, and physical health and safety of our students and staff and to keep our students learning at a high level or as relatively a high level as we can in these strange circumstances. That proposal for all students, uh, pre-kindergarten to 12th grade, uh, includes students being divided into two groups, attending school in person two days a week, and that's gonna be either Monday and Tuesday or Thursday and Friday. And then that leaves Wednesday for providing individualized support to students engaging in professional learning and planning for staff, as well as deep cleaning the buildings. And all the students and staff are supposed to attend wearing masks and practicing physical distancing. So I wanna start with a conversation specifically focused on students. And I know some of you aren't in those districts, but have been having these conversations. So in focusing on students, their challenges and their needs, as you prepare for the hybrid reopening or whatever reopening you're gonna be in, um, what are the opportunities and challenges you see for students and specifically the different age group issues and demographic issues and abilities that you each represent? I'm going to start with our principal, uh, Noel, and see uh, what you've got to offer us as you're trying to plan for this. Mr. Noel Green. Thank you so much for this opportunity to speak. Um, I think what we're, what we're looking to address really is uh, issues involving um, equity and engagement. And as we saw from the spring when we went out completely and students were not in the building, um, it, it was it was tough for many of our students. You're, you're talking about at the high school level, students having done school in a certain way for upwards of 10 years of their life and to have such a drastic transition from being in school with their peers, um, having face-to-face -face instructional opportunities with their teachers, having extracurricular uh, opportunities and um, steady access to food, to have that change on a dime as it did was, was tough, it was daunting, um, but we certainly learned a lot. Um, and I know that there are concerns about the um, uh, safety concerns about bringing students back into the building. But the more that we can move to creating the regularity that our students crave, which is having them in the building at least part-time, because I see this as part of a continuum. You know, the goal would be to eventually get them back into the building full-time, um, but I'll certainly take having them in, in the building part-time right now, um, different than the spring. 
Um, do the challenges still exist? Obviously they do. Um, we're still concerned about the welfare of students and teachers, but I think that with the precautions that uh, schools are taking in regard to the physical distancing that's happening in classes, um, the use of masks, I think we can obviously not guarantee that everything will be perfect, but I think that we are all responsible enough to put the recommended practices in place to keep people as safe as they can, both students and faculty. Across age range, I do know that there are some um, different considerations. So the conversations that continue to happen, I think, have been thoughtful. And I think as we go and we receive more information, we will be able to pivot if we need to. Well, thank you. Uh, Kate McCann, can you offer us a couple of thoughts? Uh, great. Thanks. Thanks for the opportunity to be here. Um, I, I speak with the hat of being a high school teacher, and I, I would, I'm excited to say that the hybrid reopening plans offer schools the most flexibility, um, but they do carry risks by putting people inside the buildings together again. Uh, they allow for students most in need of academic and special supports to receive them face-to-face -face interactions. Uh, but we know that students need to feel that they belong somewhere and uh, the school is where they belong. They, they know this, uh, like Noel was saying uh, about um, having done this for 10 years of their life. Um, I think that there are some things that we can uh, make sure that we do for them. Um, one is ensuring high speed internet access. And I don't know, you know, that's beyond the scope of the school district. That's more at the state level that that needs to happen. I think there's a lot of anxiety around going back to school. And I think that if students um, knew that they had the high-speed internet access to work from home when, when remote learning is necessary, uh, that, that, that they would feel better. I think we could offer them a virtual orientation um, for students and parents about what these hybrid school days will look like. Uh, we can provide easy to access IT support for them in the moment when they are at home doing remote learning. Um, we should, as teachers, be conducting early assessments to determine where students are academically so that we can figure out how to best support them um, moving forward to move their, their learning, advance their learning. Uh, and also there needs to be some planning um, around the needs of our most vulnerable students, which I suspect that Chris and Jessica will speak about. And I wanna make sure that we're ensuring that uh, we're supplying breakfast and lunch to the children um, on the days when they're not at school. Thank you, and uh, we'll jump right into that. Uh, Chris Guros, what are your thoughts on some of those issues uh, for the kids? Hi, David, I'm happy to be here. Uh, so I'm a special education teacher in Montpelier, and I've been involved in just district-wide uh, planning. Um, we're really trying to work on a collaborative model in Montpelier Roxbury schools. So we've been going down weekly and planning with admin, and we have building-based teams. and. First and foremost, I want to stress that that collaborative approach where the teachers that are going to have the students in the room are involved in the planning. Um, we're there and we can point out things that might not work and just make the best possible plan. And just first and foremost, teachers need to be at the table when these plans are made. When we do get students in the building, uh, my primary concern is their social and emotional well-being, and that's what's at the forefront. Uh, we've been discussing the idea of doing individual conferences with families before school even starts. There's been a range of experiences families have had during this pandemic and knowing uh, what the needs are before they set foot in the building will allow us to, to maybe put some supports right in place right off the bat. Uh, another concern we've been thinking about is, um, you know, uh, there's a strong possibility at some point this school year that we'll go back to remote learning. And if we do have the opportunity to do in person, how can we best set up that period for success? And that means training uh, particularly younger children on how to learn virtually in case we're, we're, we do have to go back there. We all hope we don't, but we, we, we know what's happening nationally. Uh, and then students with special education um, are obviously a, a large concern of mine. A lot of the work I do tends to be I'm really close to my students when I'm teaching them. I'm using concrete materials, sitting right next to them. And now I'm thinking about instruction uh, from six feet away uh, without guidance yet from the AOE around what we can really do in special education. So we have to figure out how to do our job uh, completely differently and we, we await that guidance. Uh, that's all for now, I think. Sure. Uh, Jessica Harris, do you have some thoughts you can offer similarly, although you're in a much more 
uh, in a smaller town in a more remote part of the state. So, Jessica. Yeah, thank you. I, I appreciate the opportunity to uh, be able to, to join the conversation. Um, I would echo a lot of, of, of what we've heard from uh, my, these other colleagues. Um, our situation, I think, is unique. We are um, very much more kind of, you know, our, our challenges are a lot of, you know, we're, we're all very spread out and, and it, we found during remote learning that internet was a big issue that they just, we didn't have access to things to make those, uh, to be able to do remote learning. And, we, you know, we had challenges of families who didn't, uh, they didn't feel that it was, it was the best option for their, uh, for their families to be able to do the remote learning, um, specifically with special education. You know, we have students who have um, individualized educational plans for a reason, um, and those don't always coincide with virtual learning. And you have learners who aren't able to access education on a virtual platform. So that's a big challenge for us, um, knowing that we want to be back in the building and we want to be working with our students and giving them the best, um, you know, the best that we can offer them, knowing that we want to keep them safe we want to keep ourselves safe, um, you know, and, and I would echo, um, you know, what Chris said about, you know, we're used to working really intensely and very closely with our highest needs learners and our most intensive needs learners. And that's how they learn and they need that consistency and they need that, um, you know, that they need to know that they come in every day and they're going to see these people every single day and that's part of their learning and growing. Um, so that would be my concern with, with a hybrid model for them is just they lose they lose that consistency and they lose um, virtual learning isn't necessarily equitable for our most intensive needs learners. And I think that for us is going to be one of our biggest challenges with the demographics of where we're at in the location. And um, Senator Bruth, I'm going to ask your thoughts. And I actually do want to come back to Jessica and Chris with a sub question in a moment, but Senator Bruth. Uh, thanks, David. And thanks for putting this together. I just wanted to, if I could, tie on to what was said about special needs students. They've been my biggest worry all along. Um, students who need um, really solid wraparound services when they're in the building, but were sent home and because of the pandemic couldn't access any of that. Those students tend to need routine uh, and their parents need predictability in their students' lives. So that was a, a worst case scenario that piece of the emergency. Um, but, you know, in a kind of perfect storm, uh, at the beginning of this month, the Department of Education at the national level actually issued a warning to Vermont saying that um, they were threatening to intervene in our special education system because the Agency of Education had been um, so behind in a number of data gathering operations and passing that information onto the federal government and potentially not serving the students the way the state should. Um, we've been hearing this in my committee from special educators for a number of years that uh, AOE has been behind in those areas. So if you put those two things together, it's highly problematic. It's something my committee has been working on, will continue to work on. Um, the only other thing I'll add there is that federally, students with IEPs are guaranteed compensatory education when their IEP can't be followed for some reason. So those special needs students are owed compensatory education as we start again, and I don't have to tell Chris or Jessica that. Um, so that's got to be one of our first priorities is making up for what we weren't able to provide and preventing any gaps in the future. The last thing that I wanna say is that the state received $1.2 billion in CARES funding. Of that, we set aside $150 million for K through 12. Of that, 100 still remains, mostly if we can get flexibility to use to fill the huge gap in the education fund so that we don't have skyrocketing property taxes. But that left $50 million, which we appropriated before we left the building. And that was to pay for 12 million or so of COVID expenses that had already been incurred, but uh, also to pay for, for instance, summer nutrition 
and other things that were in the offing. Um, one last thing, my committee asked a number of experts, what would be the best way to make schools safer with this COVID money? And we were told that immediate emergency upgrades to HVAC and air circulation systems was the answer. And so we put together a $6.5 million emergency upgrade program, which will be run by Efficiency Vermont. And they will be and are now reaching out to districts um, to see who has work that can be done quickly and finished by December 31st, which is the deadline not just to appropriate that money, but to actually spend it. So um, I'll stop yeah. there and uh, thanks for putting this together. Uh, thank you. I, I'm going to go back to Jessica and then Chris for a moment. Um, one question I have is if the schools do a hybrid approach and there's potentially more room available in the schools, is there a further hybrid that would allow the folks in your roles with those kids that need daily attention to have enough room to be spatially distant to allow for five day a week instruction to create that consistency that you talked about? Uh, and we'll give Noel a minute on that as well at the, at the principal level, trying to organize your space. But is that something that special educators are advocating for that might work? Although is there, you know, I, I have no idea. It just came to my mind. Um, no, that's, that's a great question. Um, you know, we, um, like Chris had mentioned, we're, we're waiting on um, some, some specific guidance from the AOE on, on what they're going to allow and, and what it's going to look like. Um, unfortunately, we're all kind of in a holding pattern because we're waiting for that guidance. Um, I know in, in our building and in, in our district, um, we are looking at um, being able to serve those, you know, to serve those, uh, serve those students where it, you know, it may become where it's a one-on-one -on -one situation and you have one child, you know, one child in the room and then you work with that child and then you, you know, clean everything down you know, uh, kind of sanitize everything before you bring the next child in so that you kind of prevent that cross-contamination. Um, the other guidance we've been given is if we're working with small groups, if those, if those students are in the same classroom or the same pod, then they can come up and work together. If they're not in the same classroom, then of course we have to keep them separate. Um, I think that if there is a hybrid situation where it opens up more space, I think that's a great option, but then you, for a lot of the families up here, that now poses um, a transportation issue um, because a lot of the a lot of our a lot of our community relies on the busing system. Um, you know, a lot of our families have have children that are in in the daycare systems and own and run daycare, so it it, it can become a logistical um, situation where they're trying to manage between, you know, getting their child back and forth. Um, still working and just managing all those different demographics from from yeah. just from a location standpoint. Sure. Uh, Chris, do you want to add just a quick minute on some of that if Jessica didn't touch on everything? Yeah, no, I, I uh, would echo what, what Jessica said for sure. Um, you know, in Montpelier, we're looking at a five-day school week, but even within that, there's some question of we're trying to maintain the integrity of these pods of students. So there's not as much risk if kids cross. And that presents some challenges for kids that would sometimes learn in a small group. I teach a lot of math. It's really hard to teach math individually because kids need to hear each other's thinking. Uh, so problems like that we're thinking of. Um, another conundrum is a lot of our students that are at highest risk might have a health condition that makes it so they really shouldn't be attending in-person instruction with other students. And so they're stuck in the virtual world, uh, which for a lot of kids does not work well. But for schools that are doing a hybrid model, I think considering bringing special education students in more frequently than two days a week is a great idea because particularly in students that might have a, a intellectual disability, one day of instruction for their special ed services is not going to show they're not going to have any growth in that model. Uh, Noel, do you want to add a, a teeny bit on this or should I move on to the next question? I, I think you can move on. We have some similar similar concerns as the uh, last panelists. Got it. So um, I'm going to shift from students to 
the focus on students to now think about educators and support staff. And of course, uh, many of you are in those roles. Uh, I've heard from many teachers and support staff who have concerns about what in-person learning means for them. Uh, some are part of a vulnerable group or live with a loved one who is in a vulnerable group or they, and they worry about the health risk. Others ask what will happen if they get sick or if a student gets sick in the school, what are the rules um, with COVID specifically? Uh, and almost all of them have talked about the challenges of educating, inspiring, and supporting students in a remote environment. I think, Chris, you just spoke to some of that in terms of learning in person in a group versus solo. Um, can, can you share some of the concerns you have and you're hearing and ideas uh, for how we might address them? And I was going to start with Kate um, as one of the teachers in the group, if I could. Sure. Thanks, David. Um, as we know, small class sizes contained in a small section of the building will limit the potential of the spread of the virus. Um, and at the high school level, we're also talking about these pods that, that Chris mentioned. And our pods would be three to five times as big as the elementary or middle school pods that are, that are being um, considered. Um, and I just, I want to take a minute to just sort of think that through. Um, with the schedule currently, considered at U32, uh, we'd have about 60 kids in a pod. And additionally, we'd have contact with 11 to 13 other students um, that are part of our teacher advisory. And of those 11 to 13 students, they're potentially um, not, not in our pod. They're very likely not in our pod. So they're outside of our pod. So they would be coming to us in the morning um, into our pod, or we would need to go down to their pod to see them. Um, so for instance, I have 12 eighth graders in my teacher advisory. And so even though I teach 11th and 12th graders, I would need to probably go to their location um, and meet up with them in the morning for the first 10 minutes of the day. And then I come out of their space and I go to my designated space. Uh, but perhaps worst case scenario, even though I'm social distancing and wearing a mask, let's say that I have contracted the virus. So I take the virus with me to those 10 minutes in another area of the school. Uh, I'm with my 12 TAs who then might break off into three or four other pods for the remainder of their day. I go back to my pod and I come into contact with the 60 students that are in my pod as well as maybe six or seven other teachers. Um, and I just think that we're now those students in eighth grade in their pods that have come in contact with me are at risk of spreading the virus. They, I'm at risk of spreading the virus further within my pod. And I just think um, we're talking about a really dangerous experiment. And I don't think that we have all the answers and we haven't thought it through all the way. And I just, I don't know what to do about it, but I, I know that these are some of the things that we're talking about within our Not sure if others can hear you. I can't hear her all of a sudden. I, I think we lost you, Kate, for a moment. So I'm going to uh, move on to Chris and maybe we'll get Kate your last sentence of thought if we can get your, your connection a little better, which of course, <laughs> why not have a connection issue as we've been talking about remote learning, which I know teachers have been challenged with and students. So uh, Chris, do you wanna chime in on this a bit? Yeah, uh, I, I think the first thing I want to say is there's there's science out there that says, you know, this is pretty okay and as about as safe as it gets, but the science is really developing and there's a lot we're learning. I mean, just last weekend, a study came out and says kids 10 or above can spread this just as much of a, as adults. And when I talk to a lot of teachers, they're terrified about this idea. And so there's the the scientific idea of this is safe, but then there's also emotional safety. And I, when I speak with a lot of teachers, we're not there yet into a place where we feel emotionally safe going into the building. And that, I worry, is going to affect how we're going to help kids feel safe. So there's a lot of work to do to get teachers in a place where they're feeling okay about this. I'm extremely concerned about teachers who uh, have a health condition or live with somebody who does. And in my opinion, uh, a lot of districts are offering a remote option. We have to find a way to uh, create an accommodation where a teacher in that high risk category or lives with somebody who does can teach remotely. 
but that in itself presents more problems. You're a high school and you have four English teachers and they all happen to fall into the high risk category and you want to uh, be teaching in-person English, what do you do? Um, so I'm concerned about that. Uh, you know, if, if people do get sick or, or their kids' school or daycare closes, folks, are, there's going to be higher absenteeism this year. And so I'm concerned about substitutes. Uh, we're trying to figure out a system in our schools where uh, some of our other teachers can back each other up because we don't, we're anticipating not being able to get subs or even if we can, uh, it's presenting a situation where, you know, kids try to pull one over on a sub and when safety is involved, that's problematic. Uh, so I'm concerned about that. Yeah. Uh, I believe that's all, there, there, there's a lot, uh, there's a lot of concern right now on, on the part of teachers. Thank you, Jessica, can we uh, jump over and uh, hear some of your thoughts as a teacher and then we'll go to Noel and, uh, and Senator Baruth to wrap it up. Sure, thank you. Um, I think, you know, every, everyone has concerns. Um, you know, we worry about the safety of the teachers. We worry about the safety of, of the students coming in. Um, you know, I'm, I'm very fortunate to work um, in a district where we really look out for one another and, and we want to be there to support each other. And, and, you know, we have strong relationships with our families, with our students, and, you know, we want to make the best possible situation for everybody involved, um, knowing that we're trying to do so in a time where people just don't feel safe and they're not sure about coming back into it. And there's a lot of unanswered questions. Um, and I think that plays into what Chris was talking about, where there's a lot of unsettledness going on. Um, it isn't an issue that the teachers don't want to be back in the building, but they're concerned about their families. They're concerned about what happens to themselves if they get sick and then they take a home to their family. Um, you know, I have, I have three, three children that I have to keep in mind knowing that I'm going into the building. Um, I know that we have our paraprofessional staff who are, you know, a crew of some really amazing people who are really concerned about coming back into a situation and having to work intensely with, um, you know, we work pretty up close and personable, personable with a lot of our most intensive needs learners because that's what they require. And so there's a lot of unanswered questions that we're still waiting to hear from, but there is a lot of, I think, just unsettled. There's a lot of questions and a lot of, you know, what do we do if this happens or, you know, just navigating those waters. Um, right. Thank you. Noel? I, I think um, we are where we are because this is unsettling and unprecedented. We're so used to having such control of our, our schools, our own physical and emotional safety. Um, we've known how to react when we have uh, catastrophic type events happen. Um, and this is unchartered. Um, I think that's why there's a lot of fear because there is so much that's unknown. And unfortunately, there isn't a way to guarantee um, uh, that structures in place will be 100% effective. And I can understand why there's some trepidation about coming back. Um, there are no guarantees. I mean, I think what makes it even more nerve wracking is that, you know, um, usually summer is pretty jovial, you know, you're, you're relaxing and you're really, you know, recharging and getting ready for the school year. But unfortunately, we are consumed right now with what is this going to look like? And we're getting closer to our school. Um, and there aren't answers. Um, one thing that we have to do is be transparent in regard to providing information and the most recent science for people. I'm actually going to be hosting a, a meeting, a midsummer meeting with my faculty uh, next Friday, which is obviously unprecedented. I never have faculty meetings in the summer, but this is important because our teachers will need an opportunity to ask questions. They'll need an opportunity to express their concerns or fears. But even more importantly, it will be an opportunity for them to uh, give some suggestions. But what we need even more, uh, more importantly is just a way to um, encourage each other because this is something that we're all going to have to uh, navigate together. We don't have all the answers. Um, and I, I don't blame anyone for that because the, the information that we're getting, it seems to change daily. Um, we're learning more in terms of the science. Um, I, I am feeling a little bit better because what I've heard recently is that um, there's more of an airborne, airborne concern with the spread of COVID compared to 
uh, surfaces. And I think we have the ability to control the airborne piece more so um, with the mass, with the, with the distancing. But again, it's not foolproof, um, but at least we know a little bit more. So those will, that information will help us to inform our decisions as we move forward. Thank you, Senator uh, Ruth. Do you want to offer any uh, closing thoughts on some of this around what you've heard from people and or uh, take it into consideration? Yeah, I, I did a call with uh, the Vermont NEA and on that call were many, many teachers, but also bus drivers and staff. And I've, I've heard the concerns, um, I share them. The, the thing about this emergency, uh, it really has taught me a lot about how you try to govern and how you can't govern in an emergency. So the constitution gives the authority to the governor to respond quickly, nimbly, and then the governor's agencies, like the Agency of Education. And that's pretty much how we advanced as a state in trying to flatten the curve. So it works to order people out of danger. You can and you should do that if you're the executive in charge, whether it's the governor or the superintendent. But I also learned that you can't order people into danger. Um, so if you think back to the beginning of the emergency, the Scott administration wanted to set up childcare for the children of essential workers. And the first thing they did was to make it mandatory that districts would provide this uh, childcare to essential workers, in effect, ordering childcare providers, or in some cases, teachers who don't normally provide childcare to staff these operations. And they ultimately had to pull that back because there was a groundswell of opposition from teachers and caregivers who didn't want to be forced back into the room. So they went with a voluntary model. People that were comfortable doing so did so. People who were not or had vulnerable family members could pull back. That's, I think, got to be the guidance that we use here. So there should be a, a fully standard means for teachers to remove themselves from the classroom without injuring their status, standing, um, pay scale, any of that. Uh, I would use the University of Vermont as an example. I teach at UVM and for the fall, what the administration has been doing is um, allowing faculty to opt between the different modes and then scheduling different classes in those different modes. Um, you don't need uh, to prove medically that you're um, at risk for COVID-19, they are more or less taking your word for it or uh, having a vulnerable family member, but it's being set up so that they're negotiating with the union and they're offering multiple avenues of flexibility to staff. I think that should be standard across the state for K through 12 districts. You can't, again, order people to take risks with their lives. It just ultimately won't work. Great, thank you. Um, I'm gonna just point out the next order of speakers before I go into the question. And uh, I'm gonna start with uh, Principal Noel and then go to, uh, let me see what I wrote down here. Uh, Jessica, then Chris, then Kate, and Senator Bruth last. Uh, this, this next question has to do about the overall goal for all of us is to ensure the health and safety of our students, our educators, and of course the greater community. I think safety and health is what we're all thinking about every day as we figure out opening the economy, opening schools, opening various bits of commerce, public spaces, and specifically to schools, the logistical challenges that school administrators and educators are facing are, are daunting. Uh, and you know that's why I'm going to you first, uh, Principal. Um, from spatial distancing to temperature checks, uh, potentially uh, custodial services. There are so many ways that COVID-19 can spread. And what health and safety measures are being implemented or being considered? What might still be needed? How can the state, the community, and even parents help to ensure uh, that schools are safe? And, and actually just this morning, uh, the governor, uh, in my opinion, finally, uh, issued a mask mandate. I think for schools are going to be mandated. Um, Noel Green, can you talk about sort of the safety? What do you do and, and what can the state community or parents do to help ensure schools are safe? 
or as safe as can be. <laughs> yeah, and that's what I keep re reiterating because <laughs> you really have to qualify that word safe. You that's know right. what I mean? Um, as safe as you can be and as responsible as you can be. Um, I think when you get into the realm of people um, not assessing all of their needs or or not really evaluating what's going on, I, I think that's when you get into the realm of being irresponsible. But I think if you're considering all, evaluating all, and studying all, you put yourself in a position to make the best possible decisions. Um, I I I want to put out there that I have high praise for the work that Burlington School District has done so far in our planning. We have uh, committees that are assessing every aspect of how we do school business um, with the standpoint of making plans for how we reopen. And obviously health and safety is the, is the number one. Um, and so far, I think that guided by the guidelines set by the state and by the CDC, I think we've been doing a tremendous job of considering all these things. I mean, we're doing things that are typical of other schools. You know, we're going to be mandating the health screenings and check the four students to arrive at school. Um, we're going to look at make make sure that we abide by our, our distancing policy. We're going to try to keep it separate. I mean, we're analyzing every aspect of, you know, even uh, food consumption within the school. But at the same time, um, trying to address the needs of our students. You know, they need a safe space to be. They need food. Um, they need a warm building. Um, we're looking into, not looking into, we're going to obviously abide by the mass. There will be uh, uh, plexiglass shields in, in some parts of our school, which will help keep especially our staff and our teachers safe. Um, so there won't be an inch of any school that's not evaluated in terms of um, its ability to, as best it can, keep people safe. Thank you. Uh, Jessica Harris, why don't we uh, hear your thoughts and safety and, and measures that the community of the schools can take? Yep, thank you. Um, I think I would echo um, some of the sentiments that were already said. Our uh, kudos to our district. Um, you know, one of the things that a lot of people have jumped in the summer to work on is different work groups and task groups that have all gotten together and that are meeting um, kind of on a regular basis that are taking each, you know, kind of facet of, of what school days used to look like to adapt into what they need to look like now to ensure that we are mitigating as much risk as possible. We know it's not going to be a foolproof um, situation. That's just the nature of how this works. Um, I know in our building and in, in our supervisory union, masks um, for teachers and students will be required. Um, we are making every effort possible to make sure that if a child comes in and doesn't have a mask, that, you know, that they will have one provided for them as well as the other guidance that we've gotten from um, the AOE as far as temperature checks. And um, in our building, we're looking at, you know, how do we not commingle groups for students that are coming, on, coming in on the buses versus students that are being dropped off by parents, um, you know, and how do we kind of route those so that there isn't that cross there, um, you know, and, and it, it boils down to that, um, you know, we're doing, we're following the steps that we can follow to ensure as much of the safety that we can. Um, I think of any time that there's a time for grace, it would be now, um, you know, and, and, and everybody just kind of understanding that this is not new territory for us. This is not an ideal situation for any party that's involved. Um, as far as the community goes and the teachers go, you know, we're, we're teachers, we're parents, we're community members. We have the same concerns that you do. Um, and now would be the time to just exercise grace with one another and knowing that it's not going to look like the traditional situation that we've been accustomed to for a long time. Well, thank you. And uh, Chris, what are some of your thoughts on this? Uh, similar to what's been said, I'd, I'd like to give high praise to Libby Bonesteel and the admin team at Montpelier Roxbury Public Schools for uh, just getting started on this quickly with the involvement of teachers and support staff. Um, and I think what we're trying to do is when you look at the guidance from the AOE, there's a lot of spots that say when possible. Uh, and that really means that that's the safest thing to do. And that's what we strive for. And so uh, some of the challenges are the building I work in, Main Street Middle School, is over 100 years old. And that means that um, there's some windows that don't open that need to be fixed for ventilation purposes. We need to look at all the spaces in the building and see which classrooms are, are possible for distancing. Um, 
you know, looking at the HVAC system and getting that in a proper working order so the ventilation's good. Um, you know, there, there's spaces in our school that in the, in, in the heat can get really hot, you know, and that, that's a concern with the masks on. How do we mitigate that? Uh, we are operating from a pod model. So really the idea is kids will come into the school and they'll go to one classroom and that's where they'll be for the day except for, for recess. And we've thought through everything uh, down to which bathroom is each group going to use to mitigate risk. So, uh, you know, as Noel said, there's no way to guarantee safety, but we're just trying to mitigate the risk as much as possible, which means school is going to look quite different. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, Kate McCann is one of our teachers. Why don't you uh, give us some of your thoughts? I, I would also echo that we should uh, give praise to the, um, the school districts. Washington Central has been working hard with teacher involvement on different task forces. One thing that um, I haven't heard yet is the shortage of custodial staff. Um, it's extremely difficult to get cleaning supplies right now, and it's extremely difficult to get the PPE for custodial staff needed in order to, uh, to do the safe cleaning of our buildings. Um, but more than anything, uh, we're short on the custodial staff themselves. Um, as a leader within my local association, not a day goes by before I get another email like this one. Kate, I have a medical condition that puts me at high risk for COVID-19. Or the one that I got this morning, which says my partner, although recovered from cancer, still has a compromised immune system. And I'm very uncomfortable with entering the school building for long periods of time. Uh, we need some clear statewide guidance like we had in the spring to aid local districts in determining who needs to work remotely in order to protect our most vulnerable teachers and staff. Um, yeah, wow. Thank you. Uh, Senator Bruth, do you have a closing thought on, uh, on this aspect of the conversation? Sure. Um, I don't know if you all have noticed, but behind Jessica, she has a little message and uh, that message is, while it's always best to believe in oneself, a little help from others can be a great blessing. Um, I think that's a good mantra as we go forward. So in the State Statehouse, uh, we are counting on local districts and superintendents to make very tough decisions. But what we're trying to do as a little help is, I said that we put aside $50 million for K through 12. The um, Secretary of Education has the ability to use that money as he sees fit. And superintendents have a code that they can put in for anything that they believe is COVID related. And those just total up and they will be covered um, by December 31st, if not sooner. So the money is there and the flexibility is there. Just wanna give one example of that. So I work at UVM, I said, um, but UVM is one of a great number of institutions of higher learning. Lots of students, thousands and thousands of them, will return to Vermont from places where the virus is not nearly as well under control as it is here. So my committee all of a sudden realized we had supplied money for the state colleges for testing, and we had supplied money to UVM, but the independent colleges, we hadn't provided money. So we did last minute work to come up with $5 million for that first wave of testing as students re-enter or enter the state. So that's an example where an oversight could be corrected before it became a problem because we had that pot of money there. So I'm, I'm hoping that that uh, eases things in your districts. As I said, there's another 100 million yet to be appropriated in August, um, but hopefully, money will not be a problem. I take Jessica and Kate's points about scarcity of equipment, scarcity of custodians and other necessary staff, but hopefully nobody is in an unsafe environment because of dollars. Well, thank you. Uh, we are nearing the end. We're gonna go a couple minutes long, but not too much here. You've all done a great job with your informative and concise answers, so thank you. Uh, as we get to the end, um, I know there's a many, many other topics that we weren't able to address. I'm gonna give each of you a quick minute to share one last one or two additional thoughts, uh, suggestions, questions, or needs that have not yet been covered that 
either administrators or superintendents or the state could be thinking about or thoughts for parents to think about uh, as they contemplate how to safely send their kids or as safely as possible send their kids to school. So just one or two quick thoughts. Uh, I was gonna start with our teachers because um, they're on the front line. So I was gonna start with Kate. I'm gonna go to Jessica, then Chris, and wrap with Noel and uh, Philip Bruce. So uh, Kate McCann, please. Uh, thank you, David, again, for the opportunity to be here today. I just wanna say that nobody wants to see students back at school more than Vermont's educators. Uh, but not without concrete health and science-based protocols that must be followed by every school district uh, to ensure the safety and well-being of our students and staff. We, we have to have adequate access to testing. Those tests need to, uh, we need to get those results back quickly so that we can contact trace. Um, otherwise, we're going to see this virus take over schools uh, quickly and it'll be devastating to um, the students and staff that we have here in our state. Yeah, and once they've got it, uh, spreads out into the community as well. Uh, Jessica. Uh, again, I just want to, you know, I, I express my appreciation of the opportunity to be involved in this forum. Um, and I would echo um, the quote that behind me is actually on my daughter's graduation cap. And so first and foremost, I'm a mom. Uh, I'm sending a student to college in the fall, you know, and I have concerns. I have you know, a student in high school, a student in junior high. And so first and foremost, I'm a parent and I have concerns. And so I understand where our parents are coming from and, and where their thoughts are. Um, and I am also a special educator and I have worries and concerns about uh, the students that I am fortunate to work with. I'm concerned about their needs and making sure they're safe. So again, I would just echo um, to exercise grace with one another and, and be patient and know that we are all in this together. We're all in different places, but we're doing our best to make it the best that we can with the information that we have. Thank you. And uh, Chris, do you have some last uh, things you were thinking of? Yeah, similarly, I'd stress that, you know, nobody wants to be back in school more than uh, Vermont educators. Uh, myself as somebody who has a four-year-old daughter and a two-year-old son, and, uh, you know, in the spring, we spent several months with my wife working full time and me doing virtual learning with a four and a two year old. I know how difficult it is and I want nothing more than things to go back to normal. But I can also say that being involved in the school planning, this is the most difficult planning I've ever been a part of. Uh, I've done a lot of it this week and there's been nights where I haven't slept well because there's that thought like, are we doing everything I can? And what if something goes awry and we lose an educator or a student or a family member and that weighs heavy and uh, we want to do everything we can to get back to in-person instruction when it's safe and uh, we're going to continue to to plan for that and monitor the the current situation so we can do so uh, that's all all right noel you're the principal you're gonna make it all happen you're next <laughs> That's a lot of pressure. I hope no, I, it was a joke. <laughs> no, no, I know, I know. I uh, we we need that levity at this point because it's it's sobering, um, and it's a somber time um, for all of us. Indeed. And I just look to continue to work with our team. Um, we look to uh, for families to be patient as we work through this. Um, and I think there's a need for transparency. You know, we're going to be asked tough questions um, and we're going to have to be able to provide um, the best and most sound um, answers possible. Um, it's daunting. Like I said earlier, this is the, the a very different summer for me in terms of the work that we have to do. Um, I think we're all nervous because, again, it, we, we don't know. Um, I know that one important piece of work that our district is working on now is the protocols around um, what does happen if a student tests positive or a teacher tests positive. Um, and I think that as, as the sooner that we can get that out, um, I think it'll be beneficial to the families because then they can begin to um, understand what those policies are and start to make their decisions about how they wanna proceed. So the more information that we can get out there in a timely manner, um, the better. I think we've done a great job with it so far. Our superintendent and our team have done a great job of putting information out there when they get it, um, keeping people in the know. Um, we're going to continue on that trend and we're going to do it together as best as we can. Thank you. I know you're all, everybody here is working really hard. Senator uh, Baruth. 
Um, I just want to say that my daughter is a, going to be a 10th grader at BHS, and I trust Noel implicitly in what he's doing. I think they've been doing a great job of informing parents. The new superintendent, Tom Flanagan, and I had a, a great conversation about how they plan to go forward. So, um, you know, like any parent, I am, I am worried about uh, congregate settings as congregate settings, but what can humanly be done? I think BHS and the Burlington School Districts have done, so I thank them for that. Um, the other thing I would say is that if you go back to middle of March, we were sort of newly aware of essential workers, you know, the, the people who work at Hannaford's. I was thanking them, you know, really from the bottom of my heart, thank you for providing me with food. Um, if I saw medical personnel, same thing. Um, that, you know, doesn't happen to the extent it should with teachers. And I think that has everything to do with the fact in Vermont, we tie paying for schools to property taxes and it creates a, a kind of infected wound in our state. Absent that, I think everybody would have a sign out on their lawn saying, I love my teacher, I love my principal, I love my school. Um, so I just want you all to know that in my committee in the State House, we value you, we honor you, and we didn't wait for the pandemic to make your lives safer. Um, last year, we passed groundbreaking legislation to make the water in your school the most lead free in the nation. Um, and we felt like we were doing the best thing we could do at the time to make schools safer. Nobody knew that we'd now be thinking about air, surfaces, and all of it. But just so you know that, um, that we have your back. Well, this has been a, an incredible conversation. I know we could have it for hours. Uh, I wanna thank all five of you everyone watching uh, as well, uh, the five of you for a robust and informative discussion. Our public schools are one of our greatest assets. I think the Senator was just speaking to that. The dedication, thoughtfulness, and commitment shown by our educators, principals, superintendents around the state as they are quickly transitioning and did to remote learning this spring and now as they're preparing for the fall. I know it's deeply appreciated by, by me. I've got a daughter going into high school this year. Um, and I know by parents all across the state, there's deep appreciation as well as fear. And uh, I want to thank you all for what you're doing for all of our future generations of Vermonters and uh, we entrust uh, to your guidance. Um, just want to say to everybody out there who's watching, I host these regular conversations here about issues the legislature's worked on, issues Vermonters have expressed interest in. Uh, you can visit the events page on my website, ZuckermanForVT.com for details on the future conversations and recordings uh, of videos, as well as past virtual events. We've had many different past topics. They've included updates on Global Warming Solutions Act and climate issues, healthcare programs and policies, the CARES Act allocations, housing, broadband, and many, many more. Uh, you can um, find those videos on my Facebook and my YouTube pages, as well at, at Zuckerman for VT. And if you've got additional thoughts about this topic or questions or ideas about any topic, please uh, feel free to email us at info at Zuckerman4VT.com. And I want to thank everybody on the panel, everybody who's watching uh, for tuning in, and please stay connected.